Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Graph Reading Group. We are joined by David, Johannes, Leo, Jayesh, and many people involved with these two papers on geometric the Clifford algebra networks and Clifford algebras and neural networks in general. So with that, let's go. Yes. Um, so first of all, let me again also say thank you to be here. Um, I think it's now my third time, so I, I know kind of how this journal club works, and I tried to make the slides a bit um, open for discussion. So I will go through these two papers. Um, the, the first one is on the left. So this was the basically where we started all looking in this, this multi vector field view of, of, of partial differential equation modeling. And the, the second um, paper, which, which is on the, on the right and which is very recent, which has more of geometric algebra um, in it and is, is, is basically the the younger and and um, pimped brother of the left, and um, yeah, I will basically try to to summarize the journey we, we took together in this into this geometric algebra, and and talk about the motivation, and um, I hope that my yeah slides are yeah the motivation and the 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 basically the difficulties we, we faced, but also. Um, what is possible with this very nice framework for, for future um, integration in the deep learning. The team is basically these, these six people where I'm very happy to have David, Chehesh and Stephen with me and also Leo, who is, who is really as he, um, not the godfather I learned, but the son of the godfather of, um, of geometric deep learning. And he has done amazing work in in, in here in, in the University of Amsterdam. And he basically also inspired um, many of us and, and also especially me and David um, to, to look into this geometric algebra, which is um, a really nice framework. And, and I hope to, to, to introduce these, these concepts to you. They are a bit different than these concepts, which we, we, most of you are familiar in the geometric deep learning sense, but you will see that they are quite, um, um, approachable in a way and also that they offer a lot of things we usually don't don't um, think about so um i will basically have it structured in in four parts first i will try to give the motivation was what was originally the, the way we stumbled across this this clifford algebras and why we, we thought this might be appealing to to help in deep learning and and then i will give a very short introduction just the really the only basics to understand what Clifford algebras mean um, and, and what, you, what you can do. And that's what we did in the, the first paper. So where we defined Clifford Fourier transforms and Clifford convolutions. And that the end of the first part ends with, with basically the limitations and things which, which might be improved on that. And that's where the geometric algebra comes into, into the game. And that's the second paper. Um, and there I will introduce this concept of modern plane-based geometric algebra, as it is called, and how we use that to, to build mod layers. And also, since this is a graph neural network reading group, um, I will put emphasis on the graph networks you can build um, using these layers. So the, 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 the original motivation for, for these papers were, were PDE modeling. So we all know PDEs are the, the language of, of science we, we have, we can do everything from galaxy formulation, airplane design, and so on and so forth. And um, there is also this, 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 this other project I do to, together with Cheyash and a few other people where we um, did weather modeling. And, and this is of course, um, one of these PDEs where, or one of these PDE modeling tasks where you don't know the equation because nobody really knows what, what is going on in our atmosphere but you have tons of data which you, which you use together basically to, to model, um, well, to try to, to use deep learning to extract this information from this data. And this is exactly where, where these, these two topics start to meet um, because we have on the, on the one side, the geometric deep learning, which we're all very familiar with. And that is this amazing book of, of Michael Bernstein, Tucker Cohen, um, Sean Bruno and Peter Velichkovich came out where basically the, the fundamental principle is, is the study of invariance. So you, you try to use symmetry and scale separation principles wherever possible, and therefore reduce the search space of, of neural networks dramatically. And that's where what is basically you, you can um, 
counteract the cross of dimensionality. And so, so in, in a way you put a lot of physics into the data, which then helps you to learn even if the data is sparse or, or even if, if the, the, the underlying physics is very complicated. On the other hand, we have this, um, this large scale um, foundation model point of view where basically the, the, the approach is everything is in the data, physics is in the data, um, and we should have an architecture which just scales with the data and using this architecture, we will, will learn all the physics, all the invariants, all the symmetries from the data. That is of course now really put on the, onto the PDE problems, but of course um, in language and so on and so forth, we don't have physics, but we have like grammar and so on and so forth. So, so these are the two um, well approaches, which at some point, are not really coming together, but of course are very related to each other. And since we were doing large scale PDE modeling at some point, um, there's always the question which of these models um, to use and, and, and which of those like scale better. And when like intrinsically looking at these, these two differences, there was the question what happens, how, how you would categorize such data. So this is like um, a, a, a typically like very simple weather modeling um, from the speedy weather library. And it has a scalar pressure field and a vector velocity field. So the, these equations can be written down in this form. So basically we have um, two components for the vector field in the X direction, for the vector field in the Y direction, and one component which relates to the pressure. But they, since they are really coupled PDEs, they are somehow basically describing a, a three-dimensional object. And, and what happens, of course, if the scalar changes, um, the, the pressure field changes, the wind starts to flow. And when the wind is starting to flow, of course, that, that also means that the pressure field again changes and so on and so forth. So they really interact with each other. And, and that is a bit like, uh, of course you can use a transformer model or, or any, anything, but in a way, treating them as, as single objects, like as, as, as channels, in either way, if you, if you approach it geometrically or from a transformer um, foundation model perspective, you kind of throw away the, the information a priori that this is basically one object and not like three different channels. And, and that was a bit like, um, the starting point, it was very vague and, and not, not like a clear idea about what to do with this. But um, at that point, I, I should also say that the um, go-to method um, when, when talking about PDE modeling are the Fourier neural operator, or have been the Fourier operator, operators. And, and, and what they do, they basically just map into the Fourier space, um, apply piecewise um, weights um, on, on the, um, uh, a point wise multiplication, the Fourier space, and then the, the map back via the inverse Fourier transform. And that was at that part, like approximately a year ago, considered as, as one of the best methods to, to approximate these this PDE problems. And so intrinsically, we try to look at these Fourier transforms and, and, and look at them from a, a perspective, how to make them more e expressive in a way. And, and from that, um, we, yeah, we just started by, by getting such a vector field. So this is a very simple, a simple vector field with a, a few curves, um, as, we, as we all know. And, and if, if, you, if you want to code that up in, in like PyTorch or TensorFlow, it would have like some batch dimension, two channels, because we have a, 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 um, a, 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 a X component and a Y component and the, the, the size 32 times 32. And what would happen if, if, if we Fourier transform that? Well, we, we of course have two channels. So we, two, we do two individual Fourier transforms, one for the X component and one for the Y component. And then we do this weight multiplication, the Fourier space, and then we, do, we transform back. And, and that's what we yeah, tried, but the, the weight multiplication was just some random weight multiplication. And, and of course, this random weight multiplication doesn't take into account any of this interplay between X and Y components. And, and what happens as a result is that, that everything is, is basically destroyed. Not everything, but the structure is changed quite significantly. 
And that was a bit like, okay, but if this is like really the, the best method to, to model these PDEs, why is it not intrinsically kind of keeping the, the, the structure of the data? I mean, if you, if you think of a convolution and you, and you slide the filters over the, the image, the kind of, or keep the, the structure, why is it, is it destroying the, the, the structure between these two channels? But why is it having a hard time by, by being randomly initialized to keep the structure of these two channels? And then just playing a bit around, um, we, we put the, the Y component basically as, a, as, a com as the complex part of, of, of the, the complex number. So instead of having two um, real values, one for the X and one for the Y component, we just had one complex number. And that means in, again, written out in PyTorch, batch size, just one channel, but this time as a, as a complex number. And again, the, the N, X and N, Y dimension. And if we again do a Fourier transform, of course you can do a Fourier transform over complex numbers. Again, random weight multiplication, try to keep the, the weights the same and, perform, and um, back transforming. We suddenly see that although completely random weights are applied, there is much more structure preserved than we had in the, in the previous part. And that was already um, kind of, a, of the hint we had when, when looking at these different fields it might be better to, to treat them really not as separate channels, but to find a formulation which captures these, these properties of, of these channels. And that is where we started to, to look a bit into what is basically doing these things, what allows you to do a Fourier transform over a vector field. And there um, we stumbled across this paper from, from Julia Ebling and Gerrit Scheuermann Basically, they um, did in, in computer graphics back in 2005 uh, a, a Fourier transform over vector fields. So they used some flow data and transformed this, this, this vector field and analyzed it in, the, in this um, multi vector Fourier domain. So there, there was already this, this, this name, um, this word multi vector, and, and, and basically that. They had this, this problem, but of course not in the deep learning setting of, of how to fully analyze like um, vector fields, multi-vector fields. And, and that, the, that was basically the, the beginning, the multi-vector um, was the, 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 the keyword to, to search for, it, it appeared. And if you search for multi-vector and multi-vector fields, you more or less start to come across Clifford algebras. There is a, a lot of different um, ways of how to, to, to re represent these vectors and bivectors. And, and, and what David, me, and Jay has learned is probably this is not the best way of, of, to present the bivector, but it was the, the easiest way for us to, to, um, to, to approach this problem at that point. So the, the real difference between Clifford algebras and, and vector algebras, as, as we know, is that instead of having these different objects like scalars and vectors, we have one object which is called a multivector. And this multivector consists of all of, of, of those. So it, it has scalar components, vector components, and, and such weird higher order components like bivectors and, and trivectors. They are a bit hard to interpret, and therefore, like, um, they're usually visualized as, as um, um, volume elements for the trivector and as, 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 as like, um, I don't want to say plane elements because we will see later what planes are, but I, I now, now say like plane elements for two dimension. And um, for example, um, 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 op or like operations like the, the cross product and so on and so forth somehow relate to, to these bivectors and trivectors. And that's, this, this seemed very handy because this in, in some way um, was, was mathematically representing the problems we, we saw in the data. So instead of having um, putting everything as a channel, there is there seems to be a framework which which extends this 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 channel dimension into into multi vectors. So the idea was in, instead of having just um, like a bunch of channels, we have a bunch of multi vector channels. But each of these multi vector channels groups things together as they naturally do in in in, in science. And this is now a very, um, very, very short, brief introduction in, in, in Clifford algebra. So the, the, the main part of the Clifford algebra is defined by its signature. And signature is, is basically the, 
the, the number of base vectors square into plus one into minus one. So the, the PQ means that um, P base vector square to plus one and Q means that um, Q base vector square to minus one. And so Clifford algebra, um, for example, um, O0, um, zero one, um, it means that, that zero base vector square to one and one base vector squares to minus one. And of course, if you, if you think of such an algebra, everyone thinks of the complex numbers, which are kind of isomorphic to, the, um, to this, to this um, Clifford algebra zero one. But um, as, we, as we later learned, um, there's a better way of um, um, relating it to the, Clifford, to the even subalgebra of, of, of zero two, but that's, that's not um, part of the story here. Um, for, 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 for our understanding is that um, to, to get this abstract meaning of, of Clifford algebras, uh, like an example, think of the complex numbers, which can be um, related with these base vectors. So we have, um, we have one base vector, which squares to minus one, and which is this imaginary part of the complex numbers. Similar hold for the quaternions, where we suddenly have um, two base vectors squaring to minus one. And due to this relation, we can, um, we can also get the get the third base vectors. Again, for the quaternions, there's a, a different interpretation, but this is just an example. So the, the real difference is, is really that, that this part here, so that the base vectors, which are basically um, are not like where i and j are not the same, they still exist and they still help to form these, these subspaces or the, the subspaces where the, the elements of the multivector live. And these are, of course, very important because they, they are needed to build up these higher order base vectors because otherwise they would just, um, the, the, the product would just be zero. So that is what a, what a Clifford algebra in, in a very, very um, fundamental way is defined. And- um, Johanna? Yes, please. How do these like uh, bi vectors, for example, relate to pseudo vectors and these um, objects that transform differently or vectors that transform differently under um, reflections, for example, uh, how do they those relate to? Yeah, how do they those relate to each other? Yeah. So so that, that yes. So so there is a. Um, this whole um, pseudoscalar and, 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 and these, these terms we, we basically know all, they can be basically very well described with this Clifford algebra. But I, I, I think um, it's, more, it's easier to, to explain that in the, in the geometric algebra sense as we, we see in the, in the second part, because there we have this, this really nice geometric interpretation of, um, of, of planes, so where we have a ref where we, we represent everything as, as planes and also the, how planes transform can be again represented by reflections in other planes. And therefore these, these concepts get much more understandable as if, if, if I try to explain it now in the, in the, the Clifford algebra setting, which is um, very abstract. So that's at least okay. my feeling is except someone else wants to, to comment on that. Uh, I, I'd like to give a short comment here, maybe if I'm allowed. You are uh, okay. So, so that's that's actually a really good question, and and Johannes isn't at that point in the presentation yet. But but one of the key points of of these Clifford algebras is if you do it right, then everything transforms the same way. That is all your normal vectors and your co-vectors, but it turns out there's actually much more going on than vectors and co-vectors. Um, but they all transform the same way. And, and that is also part of, of the power of, of uh, the next paper, of course. But uh, I'll just let Johannes continue. I just wanted to explicitly say that they all transform covariantly. Um, so one transformation formula and one element representing that transformation. OK. OK, thanks. OK, then, then, then let me continue. So basically, we, we have this these multi-vectors at that point. And then there is the, the geometric product, which is a bilinear operation, which takes two multi-vectors and spits out another multi-vector. Um, and that's like, you can of, still, if you stay in complex numbers, right? If you multiply two complex numbers, you get out another complex numbers if you, 
uh, multiply two quaternions, you get out another quaternion. And, and that can, can be easily seen as, um, as the way, um, um, if, if you think of A being a multivector, which is the scalar component, the, the vector components and bivector vector components, and B being a multivector, scalar, vector, and bivectors, vectors, you get out doing all this multiplication, another multivector with scalar, vector, and bivector vector components. Um, and this, this is the, the so-called geometric property, and it's the, the, the key operation basically in, 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 in Clifford algebras. Um, nevertheless, the, if, if you just use it by, by multiplying elements, there is not a lot of geometric um, things going on because it and just basically is a bilinear operation which um, fulfills all these, these properties as closures, as sensitivity, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's a nice way of mapping from from one multivector to another multivector, and basically the fundamental operation um, for, for building up layers. And of course, if you, if you think of, of complex neural networks, which are done um, in abundance already in literature, and also quaternion neural networks are done, and they all operate with this geometric product in one or another way with a, a fixed um, Clifford algebra. So, and then, that is basically the, the, the fundamental idea behind all that stuff, that what we now do is instead of having these, these blue maps here, which would represent the channels, we have multivector fields. So instead of having in that way, eight um, input channels, we have two multivector channels. And each of these multivector channels has um, scalar parts, vector parts, and bivector parts. And and of course, instead of having this the standard convolution where we convolve a filter um, over these channels, which has um, the same number of, of filter dimensions, and then um, depending on how many filters you have, you get the, the outputs. Um, now each of these, these kernels is also a multivector. So, and, and each of these operation, so what I, what I sketched here um, on the, the upper right part of, of this, this multivector input field, and the, the multivector um, kernel. This operation is the geometric product, which puts them together into one um, output here, which is again a multivector. So the, the fundamental um, operation in that sense is the geometric product. And, and the only thing which is different to, 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 to a standard convolution is really that um, multivectors are grouped to, together. So these objects are grouped together. And um, the, the, the more interesting operation for us at that point was the Fourier transform. And there is another property and that is called the, the dual of a multivector. So basically you have this definition that with the highest, um, the highest element of the algebra, you can relate uh, uh, um, the, the, the duals of the multivector, for example, um, in in three dimension, it's it's easier the the, the um, three dimensional element and the, the scalar are, are duals to each other. The, the vectors and the bivector parts are related to each other, and in some way this can be found in in electromagnetism, where the, the electric and the magnetic field are um, related to each other by this this duality. So in 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 reality, they are really just one object seen in a in a multivector viewpoint. That was actually also something which, which um, was motivation for this, this work that many of these, these processes, especially in electromagnetism are described by, by like two different um, objects and each of these objects in the, is individually modeled by, by channels. So why not really use that as one object? So we have this duality, which allows us to relate um, um, to define the dual part and, and therefore relate always two parts of, of the multivector to each other in two dimension, that's the, the, the bivector and the scalar and the two vector parts. And, and, and as we see that this, this already um, has uh, all these, these individual parts resemble complex numbers. So they have the so-called pseudo scalar, which squares to minus one. And, and they have a second term, which um, yeah, basically resembles that the real part in complex numbers. And that is exactly what is going on. So that is how um, you can do a Fourier transform over this multivector field, or at least how 
the Fourier transform can be, um, um, let's say, imitated over multivector fields by by writing down this this let's let's stay in two dimensions here, but by writing down this um, this multivector as scalar and bi vector part, and then grouping the scalar and the bi vector part together as one um, complex object, and the vector parts together as also one complex object, and then doing two Fourier transforms over these complex fields and adding this they up in them up in the Fourier space. And that relates us back to the very beginning where I showed this, showed this example with this um, input vector field where we played around. And there we had exactly a vector field. So with an X and Y component and, and putting them as complex numbers, which was like pure um, try and error is exactly what happens here. So this part gets really put as a complex number and Fourier transform. And that's actually the difference to the Fourier neural operators, which treat everything as channel, do a Fourier transform over each of these channels individually, um, do weight multiplication in Fourier space and transform back. And we basically um, put them as two multivectors and each of these multivectors we split into the, the respective um, complex duals and each of these dual field gets Fourier transformed. And, and then in the, in the Fourier space, we add them, add them, we add them up such that we have this multivector Fourier modes, which we then learn to modify and then we map back. And these were the two operations. This one took us actually quite a while to, to figure out and to get going. And then, then we kind of had defined what, what we wanted to, to replace. And, and then the question was the data to look at. And there we looked at three different sets of, of large scale um, um, PDEs. So the one is Navier Stokes equation, um, the, where you have like this, this, this vector field. So this is the, vel the velocity field, which changes over time. And then you have some kind of scalar. This can be, for example, smoke, which, um, if, um, which basically moves according to this vector field. And they influence each other through some, some force terms. So treating them as a multivector is a bit far-fetched because they only interact via a velocity term uh, by a force term. So they are not really one object as I tried to, to, to say before, because vector and scalar, they are kind of, um, of course they interact, but they're not really one object as, as, so the question might be that the inductive bias is, is not very helpful here. The, the, the story is, is a bit different for, for this um, shallow water weather modeling equation, which I showed before, where you really have this, this couple PDEs. So this is very natural that they are one object or that they can be treated as one object, the scalar and vector field um, change accordingly. So, so that's, that would be very natural to encode them as a scalar and vector parts of a, of a multivector. And it's even more obvious if you go to, to electromagnetism in three dimension, where instead of having six input fields, so the, the, this, the electric field and X, Y, and Z component and the magnetic field and X, Y, and Z component, having them put as one multivector where you have the, the three vector parts filled and the three um, bivector parts filled and then transforming them as, as just one object. And that's actually also what we were seeing. Um, the, the, the right part here, um, please neglect the, the left for the moment, is really comparing Fourier neural operators against our Clifford versions on this Maxwell equation. So I don't have I'm not going to show all results here, but especially for, for this problem, we had this, this huge performance boost over the, the Clifford with the Clifford layers, which was basically um, um, due to the fact that, that, that you now really model them as one object and not as, as, as a lot of different objects where the, which the model has to, to disentangle internally. Um, also as, as usual, when you, when you have like such an inductive bias, um, the stress test if, is if you increase the number of, of training points to, to, to a very large number, um, it should never be that the, 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 like the baseline model overtakes the, um, the more inductive bias model because then it's actually not a really good bias and it does not really scale well. The right um, is, is basically where we tested our convolutions. We tested them on, on some ResNet architectures because, well, um, ResNets are not very 
um, prone to normalization schemes, um, to initialization scheme. They, are, they don't have like these unit characters where you downsample and upsample. So they're really easy to deal with and to test. Um, and, and the green was always the baseline. And we, we tested two different architectures. I will say something about that later. And, and basically the problem was that, that for the low sample regime, they, they were just basically, the resonance was not that strong, but the, the, the higher we, the more numbers of trajectories we used, um, the better the models got. And, 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 and at the, like when the performance was started to be decent, the, the Clifford ones were, were overtaking the, the non-Clifford convolutions as well. There was just something which was really funny and which caused a lot of discussion between me and Chayash that we had these two different resonance. The one was some kind of a rotation where we basically rotated the, 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 the input and the other one was the standard um, geometric product. And we did not really understand why this, why this is the case. Um, and, and we thought that this is all like kind of um, operating on this, on this, op, on this multivectors, but we will later see what, that there is actually very nice in, um, interpretation why why this is the case and and that is the the, the last thing i want to say about this paper what? yeah please go ahead why, why do you start with um few trajectories on the on the right and with many trajectories on the left yeah i should have clarified this these are two different data sets so the, the right one is the the electromagnetic no, no, no. so these are two, two, two very different data sets and each of these data sets on the right, they has, has like more than 100 time steps. And if the data um, set has more than 100 time steps, you should actually put a times 100 here to get the actual number of training data points. And these data sets have, um, no, no, I think I think the, the question is around. no, the, the like question is why is it reversed, right? The x-axis should start from 192 and yeah. go to 20, 20, 28. Uh, it's just I had three uh, minutes of being confused. Why does the error increase when you have more training data, and uh, yeah. why is, are, is he talking about these results where Clifford algebra networks are so much worse? Um, yeah, but uh, I hope no one else had this confusion. And if anyone else had this confusion, it's probably resolved uh, now. Yeah, then, then yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot argue against that. Yeah, I, we went from left to right, but there's also this the, the these are like completely different data sets. So you have to multiply that with the number of time steps in the data set. Yeah. Um. Any other questions here? Yeah, so um, what, one thing that we can see um, on the data set on the left is that uh, Clifford really starts to become better than ResNet when you have more trajectories. Uh, but on the right, um, the Clifford is better than the standard Fourier, uh, no matter how much trajectories you have. And uh, there's a much higher margin also on the right than on the left. So can you? Can you tell us why do you think that uh, you have a stronger performance on the right versus the left, and uh, yeah, why um, the why ResNet is better in low regime in one case, but uh, Fourier is not better in the other case? Excellent question, Dominic. Uh, thank you a lot. So that so I will answer this question in the, with the knowledge we had at that point. So th there was a lot of interpretation and guessing, but it will be naturally be answered when I explain the second paper. Um, so so the, the one thing which you see here on the, on the, on the left, so that's the first question, why the, the performance is so different. And that is, that is something which took us also some to figure out. The problem is really that the ResNet itself as an architecture is really bad for, for this sort of problems. So you need some, some sort of UNAP to, to capture this, this really space, these global properties. And so with a few number of trajectories, the ResNet is just learning some smoothing and no inductive bias or nothing helps against that. Um, so yeah, basically this, this shows in, in one way or the other that the, the inductive bias or, or that the, the, the general way is, is not really beneficial um, for for very low number of trajectories, which again um, is not super 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit it's a bit against this this argument, but um, that th that was how it was. It um, and and the Fourier is is of course um, is is of course a totally different operation. It's much much stronger than the ResNet, and and they are really this this multi vector transformation helps especially for low number of trajectories, and so basically the the the, the the short answer is what we need is is also some sort of, of the scaling law um, for 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 convolution architectures. Um, we see that when these convolution architectures start to get better and better, they really represent the data. But for for low number of trajectories, they just don't. And and that is one of the the questions which drove us into the the second paper. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting to know. Um, in some sense, it, it makes sense that like uh, using uh, Fourier it would be better than the ResNet because uh, with Fourier you can uh, um, have like interaction between two um, I'll call them pixels that are very far away. But yes. with um, uh, ResNet, uh, you're limited to the very small window until you reach like that hundred layer that allows the two to communicate. So um and in general yeah physics uh physics has used uh, the Fourier transform exhaustively for for that particular reason so i think it's uh nice to see here um i know they are not the same data set but like the order of magnitude of the error seems to be uh lower also on the right so yeah there, there, there's really an order of magnitude difference and that basically mm -hmm. caused jsh and me to do exactly what you said we tested some units the units were surprisingly good um and and but then we decided since units have other like peculiarities you, you need to downscale you need to upscale you need to normalize and so on and so forth we basically decided to to take that a bit out because we needed just a, a framework to um to ablate and to test this 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 um these Clifford convolutions against each other. That that was the framework we needed, and that the, the ResNet provided for a decent number of trajectories, which were quite a lot because all of these. Um, I, I think you have to multiply that by hundred to get the, the training data points, if I'm right. Okay, so about a hundred data points per trajectory. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so so. Your Fourier transform is done in the complex domain, right? So uh, you you're able to use the fast Fourier transform, right? Instead, yes, of, yeah. So the the difference is that's a technical detail, but that's a very good question. The the FNO as it as it is implemented uses the real valued Fourier transform. So it it it's it's still a fast Fourier transform, but it only takes real valued inputs, and this is like highly optimized in PyTorch. Um, the, the the Clifford really takes complex valued input fields, still operates with with the fast Fourier transform, but it's a bit slower, like a factor of I don't know one point two or one or two, because it's just not so optimized. Okay, yeah. Um, you you said the factor of one point two. I don't think that's a big factor considering you have more numbers in the complex form than in the real form. Um. um it, no, if you compare like with the same number of parameters, so so that means also that then probably it's a factor of three. But but since um, like mm -hmm. one one channel goes into complex, um, you you reduce yeah. But for the same number of parameters between these two networks. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for answering the question. So uh, you have a another paper to present, if I understand correctly. So yes. I'll let you jump to it. But first, let me say so. I wanted to 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 give you the link to the the code which we're going to um to put on where every all these layers can be tested, but it's it's hopefully coming up very very soon. The the other code which was uh, came out of this project is this PDE arena where we tested these free neural operators against units and all that, that stuff, and it's really interesting to see how these different models capture spatial and and uh, global and local dependencies and so on and so forth. Um, that was kind of a um this code base is mainly um written by jesh and it's it, it's really nice to to ablate all this stuff because there is not a lot of um research done that and and um surprisingly or not so surprisingly these these units are like super 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 good um as we all know from computer vision 
And now we come already to this, this open question. So I think one of um, many of these um, questions were already asked. So um, the, the, the one thing which was um, like obvious is, is there a better way to present this object? Because it somehow seems a bit, um, what is really going into an object? Is it, um, how, how, do, how are they related to each other, scalar and vector? It's not every data set comes as naturally as the, as the, the, the electromagnetism does. And especially if you want to do something like um, graph networks, you, you need to, to have a way to present atoms and molecules and, and, and distances and, and relative distances between atoms and molecules. And that means, um, well, you, you can't see, need a better way to encode them. Um, yeah, and then um, we stayed on the fixed grid, but we want to, to model moving objects as well. So, so molecules flying through the air, binding to each other. And, and one of these problems was that, that if we have a vector and we, we do the geometric product of this with this vector, it basically gets like scalar and bivector components, which a priori we didn't know if this is like a good thing or, or not a good thing, because basically you change the, the character of vector by doing that. And of course, it would be nice to have a framework which generalizes to arbitrary dimensions. So at that point, um, we, we had this, this nice discussions with Leo and Steven and we got this amazing intern, David, and, and basically we started to geometrize the, the whole stuff as it is called. And there's some, um, for, for those of you who want to, to learn more about geometric algebra, I can only tell you go to this bivector.net site. There are a lot of videos which are super nice and super um, introductive and um, they have nice merge too. But really, it, it helped me and it helped us, I think, a lot for, for the understanding and getting a, a good intuition what is going on. Nevertheless, I will try to really say that the, 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 the fundamental principles of geometric algebra, which were important for us to, to build them in, and I think which are important for, for many, many um, aspects. So technically, there is no difference between geometric and Clifford algebras. The Clifford algebra is, is, is basically used when we talk about mathematical concerns and the geometric algebra is when we model some geometry, but we still use that the framework of Clifford algebra. So the multivector framework, the geometric product and all that stuff. It's, it's just even like Clifford um, um, was, was more talking about geometric algebras, I think when he, when he introduced the whole concepts. The advantages of geometric algebra are um, that, that all these things like cross products, norms, determinants, and so on and so forth can be computed in an interpretable way. There is, and that is, I think, one of the biggest advantages for, for deep learning, that there is no um, bigger between representation. So what is it? Um, in vector algebra, we, we use vectors to, for, for, for a lot of things, right? For, for directions and points, we somehow um, represent them as a vector. In, 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 in geometric algebra, there is a clear um, way of, of how to present these objects. And there is a parameterization. So it's so basically we, we, we parameterize the transformation of the space and not the transformation of objects, which means that we can apply this parameterization to all objects the same. And that's basically in mind, we defined the, the, what we wanted to have, basically uh, having the, what we learned from, from the first paper, um, we wanted to have transformations where, where inputs really map through, through their corresponding vector spaces. So for example, one vector after a transformation layer should still be a vector, one bivector after transformation should be a bivector. And, and all this transformation should be, should be done by linear combinations of, of such of group actions as we will later see. And this is very important because with that, you can really build layers by, by keeping this, this multivectors and um, combining these transformations linearly. And that's what we defined um, geometric company. And, and the nice thing in, of geometric algebra is, is, is that it can be defined by the so-called pin group or it can be explained. I, I will um, um, I try not to say the word defined in there because I just tried to explain. So, and there is this, this theorem of cardan Dionet that every orthogonal transformation of an n-dimensional space can be decomposed into at most n reflections. And, and that's exactly what the pin group is doing. It's a composition of reflections. 
And any element of this, this pin group can be written as a composition of reflections in any dimension. And the, the group action, which is, is usually um, used to, to, to act of, on one element of the pin group is via this um, so-called sandwich product because it's, it's sandwiching um, the, the, the input. And um, this, this, this uh, multiplication on the left, the multiplication on the right is done with, uh, with the geometric product. And this has some super nice properties, namely that, um, let's say this, this V is a vector and this U is an arbitrary multivector. What you get out of this sandwich product is, is guaranteed to be another vector. If this V has a, I don't know, scalar vector and tri-vector component, what you get out is again, these, these, these components. So that's exactly what, what we need because this is really keeping the, the structure of the input intact. And, and this will be our group action, which will replace the geometric product as we had before. I'm, I'm a bit confused by this. We need at most n uh, reflections to uh, have every orthogonal transformation in an n-dimensional space. Like if we have three dimensions, right, a 3D space, and we have three, like if we do three reflections, then we will always end up with something mirrored, right? And yes, but you can do two can reflections do to a model. With two. In, in three dimensions, you can represent the uh, rotation, for example, with two reflections. Okay. You, so, so in three, it'll, it's just it'll be clear enough. a little bit later. Um, yeah. It says arbitrary hyperplanes, and that's actually four-dimensional. That's homogeneous coordinates in three-dimensional space. And then you get an even number of reflections. But I think that'll be in the rest of the talk. Yes. But you don't need more than three reflections to model any of this. Um, that, that's basically what it's saying. In three-dimensional space, you need four reflections because you represented in homogeneous coordinates. <laughs> yes. But that confused people now, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let, let we'll me keep that till the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so basically, um, the most important part here is, and, and that, that I think Hannes explains it, um, that, that with um, putting reflections next to each other, you can model um, transformation. So, for example, a translation is nothing else than reflecting twice in, in parallel planes. So, that is, that is shown here. If you reflect once, um, you get from one to three. If re you reflect twice, you get from one to two. That's two parallel planes, and that's how a reflection is modeled. Um, a rotation is modeled by reflecting in, in two intersecting planes. So you go again from one to three, and from three to two by um, reflecting twice in these this planes. And, and similarly, you can do can combine more reflections um, to, to model all these, these transformations. But you're basically, um, the, the space you're operating in, it tells you how many reflections you need at most to model these, these transformations. And, and that's these, these, um, these um, planes are basically the, the fundamental, um, uh, this composition of the, the of these planes are the elements of the pin group and they form all these transformations. So, like, if I have this stuff now and I want to do an arbitrary uh, transformation, what I would do is I would um, first translate translate where I want to go. Oh no, let me see. I would first rotate as I want to rotate with two reflections. And then I would translate to wherever I want to have the thing with two reflections. And now you're saying I can also do the same with only three reflections. Yeah, three will then also flip the space, right? So you need four reflections. You need so four if you, reflections. You can, yeah. yeah, so you translate to, you rotate, like you said, you, you want a rotation and a translation. So first you rotate using intersecting planes, and then you translate using uh, two parallel planes. Okay, and that so can all we're talking be compressed about... into one sandwich product. Yeah, if we're talking about this dimension, then we're not talking about the dimensionality of our um, space that we're acting mm -hmm. on, but of the, mm -hmm. the, the dimensionality of the group or the, of the representation 
of the group. Yeah, sorry, that, that, I think that should have been clarified. Yeah, you can do these four reflections in an algebra that is one dimension higher than the space that you're acting in. You're, you're yeah, so so you note, that, note that you're, we're talking about translations as orthogonal transformations. That is a weird oh. space, right? Oh. And that turns out, in, if you take one dimension more, you can do that. Yeah, so okay. normally, the... normally translations are not orthogonal transformations. Yes. They're not, not even linear transformations. I was hiding the fact that, that the space basically in so this that, that this relates to the algebra. So so usually to model translations, you in, in three dimensions you need a four-dimension space. We will see that that in a in a bit. Um and I, I think that that brought the confusion, but um, yep. yeah. Um, but is this this answered or, or at least? Um, yeah. the... I mean, I don't, I don't know how um, how translations are uh, orthogonal uh, transformations, but uh, how this now comes into play here. But I uh, understand that when I was talking about doing a translation and a rotation, this just wasn't an orthogonal um, transformation, at least to my understanding. Um, and uh, yeah, therefore, it doesn't just doesn't fall under the theorem. Yeah, so you indeed need to play a representational trick to apply the theorem so that translations are included. And that is going one dimension up. And it's basically the same as homogeneous coordinate, but now in a metric way. But maybe it comes no. later. OK, yeah. let, let me just say that you are asking all the right questions. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Detail, the details, of course, in a, in, in, a, in a short talk are really difficult to all cover. But you're definitely asking the right questions. And if you look in the paper, there's a lot more detail on that. OK. Hannes is famous for that. So, uh, so again, um, I think that the main takeaway message here is that these transformations are elements of the pin group. That's, that's what I want to convey with this slide. So you can see translations, rotations, as elements of the pin group. But the nice thing is, and, and I, I, again, I tried to give in, um, an intuition here what is going on, but also the objects are elements of the pin groups. Um, why? Because we can represent objects by the subspaces they leave invariant. And for example, um, if, we, if we reflect in a plane, the only thing which is left invariant in this reflection is the plane itself. If we rotate um, a, 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 along a, a line, the only thing which is left invariant is the line itself. And, and, and that means basically, um, or that is a way of how we can represent elements as, as ele uh, objects as elements of the pin group because we now need to find a way of how to to relate points and, and lines to this this um, um, planes or intersecting planes and we can do that by simple for example by plane using the normal vector and and in that way we have this 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 um, duality that a reflection relates to a plane and and therefore we and also relates to a vector and therefore we can represent a, a reflection by a or we can re represent a vector by a reflection or a reflection by a vector and two intersecting lines which as we sorry two intersecting planes as we saw describe a rotation um, relate to a line because it's the subspace the leaf invariant and they relate to, to a bi vector I'm quite sure that, that uh, Leo wants to say something um, to, to my explanation here, um, but um, maybe. I'm writing some things it. in the chat for people who are interested. Let's, let's just keep talking. Um, so if there is questions, you should, you should start, you, you should ask them now. But the main uh, message of this slide is that not only the transformation element of the pin group, but also the object elements of the pin group a representation of the, the elements of the pin group. And that is basically the, the whole picture. So we have in for the for the 
to describe the group O3, so um, of, of um, rotations and reflections. One, um, one reflection is a reflection, of course, the invariant subspace is a plane, and the algebra element is a, is a vector. Two reflections um, describe the group element of the rotation, the group element O3 of the rotation, the invariant subspace is a line, and the algebra element is a bivector. And um, three reflections describe some, some rotor reflections, and uh, the algebra element is, is the trivector. And uh, just, then, to, just to add, these planes, lines, and points are all through the origin when you're yes. just looking at O3. Exactly, exactly. That point in the origin we, we put here. But that's a, that's a good point. It took on also me and David some um, and to, to understand that. And if you if you go one higher, if you try to describe the, the group element E3, so so where that's where the translation come into it comes into the game. We need to, to go one algebra higher. So we have this um, third number here. Before I just introduced the P and Q, this third number now squares to zero. It's a bit um, weird, but I left it out for yeah, just for the sake of, of, of um, um, to keep the talk short. And, and now we will basically in four-dimensional algebra, we, we can play the same game. One is a reflection, two, rotation and translation, three, um, rotor transflections, and, and so on, and, so, and, and four, that is group. And the invariant subspaces now is a arbitrary plane with one reflection, a line with two reflections, a point um, with three reflections, and this is an arbitrary point, so a point anywhere in space, but if you use four reflections, you just have one point in, which is left invariant, and that's the, the point in four dimension in the origin. Well, that's not true. It's uh, two lines that are invariant that are orthogonal, but uh, it's okay. Just move <laughs> <Yeah>. on. <laughs> um, is this, that's I think the, the picture which, which, is, um, which is needed to understand how, how we build the, this, these layers. So again, um, the, the, I, I just repeat um, that, that, that the group elements are represented as, as, co as combinations of planes, but also we can represent, um, we can use this invariant subspaces to represent the, the, the objects like um, coordinates or like atom coordinates or, or vectors attached to these atom coordinates. And that actually made us build the layers. So the, the way we are building these layers now is um, we try to, this, this X, I will be the inputs to our layers. They will be um, presented by the algebra. So this will be points, lines, and planes presented in the algebra. Um, these AIs are this learnable group action. So they are composition of reflections. And, um, and that's actually what is going on because we know that this, um, this sandwich product keeps the subspaces um, intact and it does some sort of orthogonal transformation. And then we, that means we have our inputs, um, which are like geometric objects, and we will transform them orthogonally with transformations learned. And to get really a layer out of that, we linearly combine this like C times. That basically is one transformation of one multivector as we had in the previous one. Now this, this multivector gets transformed in a geometric way. So before we had this geometric product here, and now we have this sandwich product here. And that's, that's basically all. Um, the, the thing is David introduced some very nice nonlinearities and normalization schemes to basically make sure that everything stays in this, in this subspaces. And, and that everything basically gets in, initialized in a geometric way that even when, when having um, like random weights, you make sure that, that all these transformations are orthogonal transformations or combinations thereof. And with this, we can build our layers, but let me first introduce the problem. So we had this, this objects, which were flying around um, from the origin, like, if an explosion had hit them. And these were uh, some kind of Tetris objects. So um, like four points attached to each other. And 
all of these points um, are subjected to arbitrary rotations and translations, but these arbitrary rotations and translations around their rotations around the center of masses um, depend on each other. So the, the, the orange one depends on the blue one, the, the green one depends on the orange one and so on and so forth. So to get a bit of, um, um, to, to get a bit interconnectivity between these objects. And, and, and we chose that this example because what we have to model is these transformations of this individual object, but objects, but each object transforms differently. That's not an, a problem as we usually have, where we, we just have to learn the, the, to describe the space, but we have to, to describe this transformation of these objects in the space. So if the, the, the orange object transforms to according to a, to a certain transformation with certain rotations and translation parameters, the green object will transform differently. And, and so we need a layer to capture all these different um, transformations. That's exactly what, what our layer, layers are doing. And, and then the next step is basically to present all these um, points in, in, a, in a deep learning way. And that, that we know how to do that now, um, we, we basically just we have our um, multivector and we fill up the components of this multivector with the numbers which correspond to, to X, Y, Z. So via this um, invariant subspace trick. And we did two different, different sorts of experiments or David did two different sorts of experiments. The one is for, we just compared standard MLPs. So, so that means that, um, First, we stack all these um, positions into one MLP um, and, and four time steps back in history, and we just predict the next four time steps. And we do that comparing against um, O3 equivalent MLPs, SO3 equivalent MLPs, and our um, GA MLP. And yeah, we see that the GA MLP is, is, is much better suited of, because it has this, this um, transformation Principally built in, and it just has to learn um, this, this how each of these objects um, transforms. So the next, Hans, yes, am I am I getting it correctly that like um, you're not making uh, comparisons against, for example, like a tensor field network here or um, the like popular um, popular equivalent architectures because this is a rather um, a rather general representation that we no why why are you not comparing we, we are testing against equivalent architectures here so we use the backbone architectures in mlp and we compare against o3 and so3 mlps in that case because that's a but i have the next slide to 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 talk about this this difference um but yeah but but the, this is like an O3 equivalent MLP, which, which does everything that the, um, the, the O3 equivalent MLP um, can do. For, for GNNs, of course, we can, and, and, and that's probably what we are also going to do, um, include um, equivalent GNNs, so, so SC3 equivalent GNNs. But the problem for this, um, for, for, the, for, for these architectures is, and you see that for the MLPs, the equivalent MLPs basically perform as well as the non-equivalent counterparts, that it's not really an equivalent problem because you, you can transform the space, you can ro rotate the space, and then, then um, basically the angle you, you look at should, should give you the, the same um, transformation. But what it is intrinsically going on that each of these objects transforms individually. So you have to learn this transformation for each of these objects and not the transformation of the whole space. So if you, and, and that's, the, that's the hard part, that each of these object transforms differently and you want to parameterize these transformations and not the, the, the whole space. So if you look at this problem from 45 degrees to the left, um, it's still hard to model these transformations of the objects and that's the challenging part. Yeah. Th that took us a while to figure out how to, to, to represent that. And actually, if you, if you think um, when you, whenever you have like more objects moving, um, that is something you encounter a lot if you, because um, 
just just think of a few molecules moving through space. Um, sure, you if you it's nice to have an, an equivalent um, representation of the space, but it's actually the, the change of the objects you want to capture. And and that's what these layers are doing. Was this answering there? Yeah, I'm but, I'm very happy. <laughs> but you as always had asking the right questions. <laughs> So um, the 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 you, you saw the next slide right where I tried to to explain that. So that that was basically um, your question. So the equivariant mm -hmm. models are global, um, um, but but the frame of reference affects the tra trajectory is unfolding. Yeah. And and what what we want to do is we want to describe the trajectory and not capture the. Although it would be of course nice also to have the global um, property. Yeah. And um, for so so that was the MLP part. Then we, we modeled G and Ns. That's what I promised at the very beginning. And and G and Ns um, um, have this. So so basically, if you can build an MLP, you can also build an, a G and N. You can just stack these these objects together. Um, you you do do message passing between these nodes. Um, it's very easy to to stack these these subspaces together. And um, well, we, we again have the, the, the similar pictures. In general, you have to say that GNNs are much better than MLPs. Um, and we, we use these edge cons, um, different GNNs where we, we have different um, way of, 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 of parameters and, and distances. But overall, um, the, 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 the um, geometric GNNs were, were like much, much better, especially for, for lower number of parameters. And and yeah, there's there's an, there was more than an order of magnitude difference, um, which took us quite some while to because um, it, it turned out that that um, maybe David, you want to explain the or I don't know if you, we can explain it easily the problem mm -hmm. with the translation you had because that was quite nice for for the understanding. Yeah, so if, um, everything kind of clicked when I. Um... I was using a layer of Johannes from his Clifford uh, neural networks paper, and I was trying to add translation to it. But it's um, so um, what we see in the when the number of training trajectories are small, the um, the regular GNNs or the MLPs they overfit uh, quite fast, and our models they generalize much better. But when I didn't include the translation inside the so that was kind of the way that it was coded up. I didn't include the translations in the linear combination of the layer that Johannes presented earlier. Um, and then I, even though it was just like some bias term, I mean, it's just a translation offset, I saw similar um, overfitting happening as the uh, 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 GNNs MLPs without the geometric, uh, geometric algebra one. When I included the whole group action, so that is, uh, rotation and translation inside the linear combination, then I got very nice um, generalization. Uh, then it showed very nice generalization. And that so was this, uh, that was kind of revealing uh, moment for us. So this 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 sandwich product which showed showed here um, what David was saying is that there was only this was only doing rotations and the translations were were afterwards, so to say, after this. Um, so basically we were in the wrong algebra. Yeah, and um, you can uh, mathematically you can even rewrite it to be similar, but the learning dynamics um, are just. I mean, we still have to understand this a bit better, but it seems that the learning dynamics are just much nicer um, when you include all include all that in the linear combination. I I hope this was understandable, but. Uh, for me, at least, it was, and it was a, a really revealing moment. So that that you really have to use the, the right algebra. And then the the next cool thing you can do is you can add a, a vector to this um, to this um, element. So each of these um, um, points has a velocity vector attached and is moving outwards. And and basically then um, the G, uh, the 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 G C as the the, the Geometric GNNs um, uses can use the same number of parameters because the the geometric product only is parameterized by the sandwich product and whatever is here in the middle 
it you can train it with the same number of parameters that it's yeah there, there is you just get a, a larger multivector in the middle whereas the others of course you need to account for this this larger input and and also adding this disposition was was like really beneficial for for the for the geometric genome so that that was really nice and i should say we were using the the, the four dimension algebra so three coordinates squaring to one and 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 one squaring to zero. Uh, yeah, um, that was already asked by Hannes. Um, and then the final part is, is fluid dynamics. So we were revisiting the, the, uh, the questions from before. Um, and that's basically also to, to Dominic's um, question. So um, we, why is, 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 was the ResNet not very performant at, at, at low number of trajectories? And and how can we build like really strong units now that we understand how um, how normalization works, how um, um, how um, activation works, and and how can we, we can do down and up scaling and all all that. So we basically keep always in these subspaces. And the first answer it's it's also very simple to put build convolutions out of that. And, and what we now do is, is we, we think a bit differently. We don't think as, as multivectors anymore, or um, we still think as multivectors, but we think of as a 3D vector in a 2D space. That's, that's what we do. Before we thought of um, two vector components and one y vector components. Now it's a, um, a 3D vector in a 2D space. And geometric algebra has taught us that you can operate in a higher space than your data is in. And that's completely fine. I mean, that, that we also did before, where we had this four dimension space. So that the pressure is now really the, the first component and the wind is the second and third component of the vector. And the, the left plot is, is actually revisited this resonant results. And we see here for, for low number of trajectory that the standard resonance are really, um, are, are really not um, very good. And, and that's actually also to relating to Dominic's question. But the, the, the new version was, was really, um, um, yeah, was really uh, performing the same as the, um, as, as the, 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 the baseline or, or, or even better. And um, we also understood why one of these resonates was, was performing so well compared to the other, one of the Clifford resonates. And that was because we already had built some rotation into this resonate which very much resembles or was very similar to this, this geometric templates which we had introduced. And that is, that is not no surprise because in, 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 in computer graphics and so on and so forth, quaternion rotations are used to, to model um, rotations or one of the most frequently used tools. And we had a layer built on these rotations. So, so that was actually really under, letting us understand um, what is going on and what is actually needed to, to and make this, this layers work. And yeah, for the units that the results were extremely cool because um, Fiesh and me, we trained a lot of units and a lot of Fourier neural operators, but we never got such a performance. So this, this is like a tremendous low loss. And, and that is actually yeah, just because um, um, you can you normalize and you keep all that, that track into in, in your network. And that, that was done, done by David. And I think this is um, already the, the, the last slide. Okay, then thank you. I see, I see a nice 44, 44 um, uh, um, the chat says 44 messages. So I thought there might have been something going on. Yeah, there has been a lot of activity there, but Leo and uh, Steven really are uh, taking great care of it. So thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. But let's see. Do we have any other uh, questions in, in voice? Uh, any questions from Dom's side or about other applications or maybe yeah maybe do you have any any future ambitions to bring this to uh, for example the world of molecules and modeling uh, yeah atom dynamics molecule dynamics 
I mean, this is this is very obvious from the performance we see here. So this was like very extensively tested, and that's not like a small advantage, but like a really strong advantage. Of course, this this data set is tailored to towards um, geometric algebra networks working well. But it seems that that especially when things are moving, when more than than one object is moving, um, you you have a, a real ben benefit. And mm -hmm. yes. That's definitely something. And you're on. saying that if I were now to use uh, my tensor field network, and mm -hmm. for each object I predict a translation and a rotation, uh, then this would would still work better. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. Um, so, as we... yeah so uh, I mean, in the baselines, we uh, should include equivariant models in the in the GNN versions of those, and we will. That's completely right. Um, but um, um, where was it going? Yeah, the, the uh, trajectories, like we have tens of thousands of training trajectories and they are like all orientations are sampled quite densely. So um, like if you have enough parameters, then the equivariance part can, sh uh, can be learned by the normal GNNs. And e um, so like adjusting to the frame of reference, but still, the GA part seems to outperform them quite significantly in, in those regimes. So I have the feeling that the equivariant models might do really well when there's few trajectories and you haven't sampled. Yeah, you 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 don't need to learn that two frames of reference reference are kind of the same thing. But I have the feeling that um, yeah, I, I think the GA the the Clifford algebra GCA networks will still do quite well. Uh, um, after including those baselines, baselines. Okay. Well, uh, I think the domain where we don't have so many samples is also important. So yeah, maybe that will be interesting. But, um, mm -hmm. Let's get to some more questions by um, Francesco. Hi. Hi, Johannes. Hi, Francesco. <laughs> Thank you and uh, congratulations on the paper. Very interesting. Uh, I have a question. Could you explain the normalization part and why did you have to normalize at all? Uh, I think I think I hand this question over to David because this is really his work. Yeah, so I mean everything in this paper was about um, trying to interpret these multivectors uh, and their subspaces individually and keeping so the the objects that the the multi, that are embedded in the multivectors, we want to let them transform as the objects that they are. So vectors as vectors, by vectors as by vectors, and so on. That means that we also uh, uh, develop some nonlinearities and normalizations that only normalize those uh, parts of the multivector. So the vectors and the by vectors separately, and um, they are fairly fairly standard from what you would expect also from equivariant uh, literature and so on. But in the end, they were important. It was important to build that structure into the network. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Well then, Tom. Thanks for... <clears throat> Thanks a lot for the great talk. Like it was uh, very inspiring to see that. And I always like uh, when the the methods change the standard uh, neural networks to to make them more physically possible. It's always like um, always makes it better and uh, easier to understand the physical phenomena, especially I think in the case of simulations. Um, my question are more on the practical side, like if you go to the last slide with the, the results. Um, yeah, so here you show, for example, that uh, your GCA unit uh, is much better than the, the unit, especially that we're looking at the log scale on the left axis. Uh, however, something I'm wondering, like, um, about about the, the data split, something I would expect from your GCA unit is that it would perform much, much better out of distribution uh, because it can better embed the real physics that's happening uh, behind the scene. 
So I was wondering like if you had, a, for example, test set that were uh, much more different than uh, the, the training set or if they come from the same distribution. That is an extremely good question. Um, I also quite sure that 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 there that out of distribution performance of these these networks can be a big strength. I however did not say that because we just did not test it. Um, it's also for us this unit was always important to because it's a really big architecture and has everything needed in a big architecture. It has different scales, normalization. Um, it copies data from one to the from the left to the right and so on and so forth. So it's it's easy to get something work on a small MNP or a small GNN, but really on a big um, unit with hundred million of parameters is that that was the litmus test for us. Um, and that was basically the, the main goal, but I completely agree that that there is also another axis of, of, of performance to look at and that this is, these are all these out of distribution because you have just a better parameterization, what you're learning. And that's also what, what David meant that um, it, they are just more stable and so on and so forth. And I would expect that and, and we are for sure going to, to test that to, to some extent. Yeah. And, and when running these kind of simulations, um, the question that I always wonder is that will this very huge uh, neural network actually be faster than running uh, some kind of uh, real simulation? So uh, perhaps I missed it, but did you discuss like the speed improvement compared to standard simulation techniques? Uh, you, you ask standard simulation techniques. Yeah, that, that is a whole, whole, whole different um, topic that is really um, yeah. neural surrogates versus where, standard um, surrogates. I think, Jayesh, that is your, your... So I would first of all say like a lot of the claims in this community are just like wrong. They never really compare things properly. Uh, a lot of communities claim like like deep learning people claim. I, I mean, I'm a deep learning person, and I'm saying like like that ten thousand times faster claims are just dead wrong. Uh, these are not comparisons which are fair or like make sense. But overall, like at the moment, if you just think from a deep learning perspective, ignore all the other things that I, that can be done on the simulation side, like the standard PD solving and everything else. There are reasons to believe that the Clifford algebra networks are actually even better for the accelerators that we have. So think about the way GPUs work. Uh, if you have a lot of dense operations, like you, for, even, for example, why attention is so good. It is just like very simple, a bunch of operations, but you don't have to keep moving data around. So the Clifford algebra operations are also a fairly dense set of compute operations. So if you write the kernels nicely, like you could probably, you could have U, V, U inverse in a single kernel. You don't need multiple operations to implement it. Uh, it would be a much better utilization of the GPUs that we have. And you would, the slow part of GPUs, which is moving data around, is required less because you can do a lot more operations with the availability that you have at the moment. So it, in principle, these networks can be much faster than the way they are right now, even implemented. But compared to like real PDE solvers and everything else, I think some of the comparisons are just not even comparable, I would say. Like PD solvers are, I would say neural network based PD solvers are a completely different entities and they have make completely different trade-offs about accuracy and speed. Uh, there's definitely reason to believe that for very long horizon things, uh, it's very much possible that deep learning networks can do much better than PD, standard PD solving methods. But standard PD solving methods are not really being compared in the same way because a lot of the existing solvers are written in CPUs. Or people write their own naive implementation of these solvers and compare against that, which is like just not the right way to do it. Deep learning our libraries have been optimized by lots of world experts, and you would probably have to spend the same amount of effort to compare against proper PD methods. Uh, but PD methods can also be written to work on GPUs, and people have been doing it. Uh, a lot of like, if you look at a lot of Julia Clima projects, for example, or a lot of other projects in CMD and everything else, people are rewriting their PDs always to work on these accelerators directly. And like you can use CUDA to write those things as well. What are the trade-offs? What exactly can we, can we get? How much faster can we get? These are all like not 100% known, but uh, that is, uh, I would say a different kind. I think there are different classes of solution methods and they would have their own trade-offs. 
you will never get the same kind of accuracies that you get from a PD solver, like a proper uh, applied math PD solver. But you need that kind of accuracy is also unclear in the real world, where you already know that the real world is going to be different from the equations that you have written. Uh, so those are the trade-offs. I think this whole community has to figure out what do they care about and how should we measure these things. But at the moment, there are a lot of the claims that people make are I would take a with a huge grin, like I'll uh, bull, bull a bullet cart of uh, salt to kind of compare with the, where things are faster or slower. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, as I said, it's uh, it's funny to see like that the community does not know what they want out of these uh, better speed, better accuracy, how much. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's funny to see that. And then there's also like um, uh, neural PDE solvers instead of like using um, uh, using like QNETs and ResNet. Like there's uh, so many different things go going on. Uh, but I think, yeah, this line of work uh, is super interesting. And um, if it can help, like, solve these things faster or at lower cost or whatever, it's, um, I, I think it would be nice, especially if you have a model that uh, works out of distribution so you don't need to optimize parameters all the time. Yeah. But thanks a lot. Uh, I see there's a lot of raised hands. so. Uh, let's jump to, to the next one in line, uh, Julian. Right. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, very clear, very nice overview. Uh, my question is also pretty, yeah, regarding the computational um, side. So um, can you maybe comment on sort of the computational overhead that you have with the GCA uh, networks compared to, for example, a a group convolutional network or even just the vanilla convolutional networks? I, I, I think Jayesh loves to answer these questions. So nice. otherwise I will answer Jayesh or should I? Uh, what was the question again? Can you just remind Compute me? Computation overhead. Again. Of these, yeah. uh, of our particular methods. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so both think, in terms of memory and also the, the sandwich product, if that's yeah. So, yeah. so at the moment, like the way we have implemented this is uh, using standard PyTorch operations. We're not right, trying to write our own CUDA kernels and other things. So when you do that, like you kind of have to do multiple PyTorch operations to implement something like A, X, A inverse, right? You can't do this three-way product in us in the same uh, in the same function kind of thing. You have to call multiple by toys operations. So that becomes like you're now doing multiple operations. So when you take how to do the backward part to compute the gradients, and you have to save memory for these two different operations as well. So overall, the memory complexity increases partly because of the way it's implemented. You have more operations going on. So you have all those more operations required in the reverse mode auto differentiation to save the activation for those particular things. So that's for the memory requirements are somewhat worse. Like uh, the current, but that is an implementation issue, not an issue in itself. Uh, so at the moment, things are on the forward path. There, I think they are equal, almost equal. They would not take too much different time complexity for the same parameter count. Uh, but for the backward path, we require more memory, and they usually therefore more compute as well. So these things are at the moment slower than the standard operations, but I don't, I, as I said, like these are actually better for the accelerator that we have from a hardware perspective. Somebody has to just implement these kernels properly. Okay, clear. Thanks. You don't have to, uh, wait for permission to ask your questions. Just go ahead. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, nonlinearities. So I was wondering how the nonlinearities work when you have stuff like vectors and like preserving the equivariance. Yeah. So um, uh, it's kind of the the same. We can use the same ideas from the equivariance literature where you um, scale uh, like 
had like only a norm or an uh, invariant dependent nonlinearity. So then when you rotate the vector, the, the norm, for example, stays equal and it means that you can apply a sigmoid on, on that. And then you the R, and then you can just scale the vector in a nonlinear way. And that way you don't like when the vector has, for example, if the vector has zero uh, or negative components and you apply a relu, then the whole orientation is gone. Like all, all of those com components will be mapped to zero. So you want, want to kind of avoid that. And, and there, we can use a lot of inspiration from the equivariance literature there. Does that, does that answer your question well enough? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Awesome. I think Stephen has a hand up, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know if I was uh, last in line yet. Uh, I, I just, uh, great talk, Johannes, you did a great job. I know how incredibly difficult this is. And and just for the audience, maybe to, to sort of sketch that picture, uh, geometric algebra was actually invented before linear algebra. And you guys have spent um, probably a few years studying linear algebra and Johannes has just tried to do it in, in like an hour and a little bit. Um, so that's kind of crazy. Um, and you should give yourself some more time. And I also wanted to give one last remark, which is that um, everything that has been said about planes, which gives you the Euclidean group, if you take general planes, it gives you the orthogonal group, if you take planes through the origin. Um, but if you bend your planes a little bit, then they actually be become spheres and your reflections become invergent in spheres. And the group that you are modeling is a conformal group. And everything actually keeps working exactly the same way. Everything still transforms covariantly. Uh, all of the formulas still apply. Uh, nothing really changes. And, and I'm making this remark because in the conformal group, the invariants of the transformations are no longer planes and lines and points, but they become actually spheres, circles, point pairs, which are one dimensional spheres and points. Um, so that's a very interesting set when you're trying to model uh, molecular dynamics or, or molecular things, um, because there were a few questions on the chat and, and live about that. I thought I'd mentioned that the conformal group is definitely included um, and it works exactly the same way. So, yeah. but then again, great talk, Johannes, you, you did great. Awesome. I agree that there are so many interesting directions and applications that these people have to explore and maybe you can explore them as well. And uh, maybe we'll have Johannes in the future again presenting more on I mean, maybe Clifford algebra networks for molecular dynamics or something like that. And if you want to join these sessions yourself, then all the information is in the description.